There was a lot of important new research released recently relating to COVID and children. And it's amazing to me that I'm one of the only people covering these new and very important topics. Specifically, there are two very important studies we're going to cover today. First, there's a new study that quantifies or shows the insidious damage that can be caused by increased CO2 consumption from mask wearing, especially in children. This is a controversial issue right now, the harms of masking children over the past two years. And now there's data to associate mask wearing with potential damage that can be done. Second, yet another peer-reviewed study on COVID vaccine effectiveness in children was just published in a reputable journal, JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it showed 0% vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease after only four months or so. Yes, literally 0%. Then that 0% plunged down to negative vaccine effectiveness shortly after. So in this video, we'll go over the most important and relevant COVID information you likely missed this week. We'll go through my Substack posts that break these studies down into simpler terms. Before we begin, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell in the bottom right hand corner so you can be notified when my new videos come out. Also, click my social links in the description below if you want more content like this. I post extra exclusive content on Substack and Patreon if you're interested. And also, I have YouTube memberships now that give you access to more content. Just click the join button above. Anyways, let's get into this. The first order of business here is for me to pull up my Substack post explaining this new masking study. So hold on one sec while I do that. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this first part right here, all of this. Now, as you can see, this is an Italian masking study which measured inhaled CO2 and end tidal CO2 levels using real-time capnography in those wearing surgical masks and FFP2 respirators in people aged 10 through 90 years old. Of course, there was also an unmasked control group. So let me explain all that. Let me pull up this website first here. Hold on one sec. So I'm going to highlight another area here. So capnography is monitoring or testing that can evaluate real-time CO2 levels. This is always utilized when patients are given anesthesia during surgery and other occasions. So we can see what a patient's carbon dioxide level is when they can't communicate with us. Simply put, high CO2 can kill you in surgical situations. However, on the opposite end of that, Things, elevated CO2 over time can cause some serious effects and we'll get into those effects soon. Now, a few seconds back, I brought up how this study measured end tidal CO2. Essentially, that's the amount of CO2 released at the end of exhaling. So overall, these are good measures being taken in this study. Now, as previously described, I also mentioned that water removal tubing that was used in this study. Well, that means most humidity or water buildup from masking and those included in the study, which could otherwise alter the results, was removed via tubing or water tubing. So let me switch back to my Substack post. Hold on. Now, if we look here at the second paragraph, we see the results. Let me highlight this again. Okay. So within minutes of donning both surgical masks and FFP2 respirators, children experience CO2 concentrations higher than the 5,000 ppm acceptable exposure threshold. Let me make something very clear to you. If it was found that there was a work environment continually exposing adults to higher than industry industry standard levels of CO2, like in this study, that place would be shut down immediately. It's just not safe. Yet here we are doing this to children. Now let me scroll down to a table here so you can get a better visual of all this. Now look here, in the children's section right here, 90% wearing a surgical mask and 100% wearing FFP2 respirators had CO2 levels above the acceptable exposure threshold. So like every single child aged 10 to 18. This is unacceptable. Let me be very clear. Overexposure to CO2 like this in any human, adult, or child has historically resulted in health problems. Specifically, on the less severe end of things, headache, drowsiness, nausea, and on the worst end of this, decreased cognitive performance. You have these kids wearing masks all day in school, and we're to believe these health regulatory agencies like CDC and AAP when they tell us 
masking kids isn't a problem, it's abuse. And now here's the data. Anyways, now let me touch on something a little bit different, that being a new COVID study on vaccine effectiveness for kids against Omicron. So hold on and I'm going to pull this up right now. Okay, now since kids seem to be getting clobbered this past week, let's talk about this. Very quickly, let me scroll down to this graph and it will help me explain things a bit better. Hold on. Let me elaborate. If you look here at the green line on this graphic of 100,000 kids in this study who received Pfizer, vaccine efficacy against symptomatic infection for those aged 5 to 11 from dose 1 and 2 dipped down to 28.9% after only two months. And if you look at the orange line, vaccine effectiveness dropped down to 16.6% in kids aged 12 to 15. Then as if that isn't bad enough, if you continue following that orange line, vaccine efficacy plummeted to 0% at around four months and then went negative shortly after that. So what does all this mean? You know, we have to start questioning if the risks are worth the rewards here. When you get down to a small percentage of protection like this, and you still have the same number of adverse events occurring, you really have to start asking if this is something we should continue to do, giving these shots to young, healthy, and immunologically competent kids, of course. And it may not be something we should continue doing. Personally, I think there's little to no benefit. As a lot of new data shows, kids do extraordinary well with the virus. Also, recent CDC data shows that nearly 80% of kids have measurable SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence, meaning they have robust antibodies and immunity against the virus from natural infection, vaccination, and probably multiple infections, symptomatic and asymptomatic. And truthfully, that number is probably closer to 100%. Now, on the other hand, you may be able to convince somebody or maybe somebody like me of vaccinating this cohort, kids between 12 and 15, maybe if it prevented or reduced long COVID, but there's literally no appropriate data to suggest that's happening. As a matter of fact, I'll put a study up on the screen right now showing a nearly 2.5 times increased odds of ending up with long COVID after getting a vaccine right here. And I'll post the link to this in the description. How come nobody's talking about this study? Anyways, those are the facts. We still need more data on this, but if there's anything you'd like to learn about in the future, please leave it in the comment section below and I'll see you on the next one.